we're going to get into a panel now. Uh, it's our machine learning panel. Uh, I want to invite, first of all, the panelists to join me on stage, if you wouldn't mind. As they take, uh, as they, as they take a seat, um, I would, uh, first of all, try to uh, give you a sense of where we're going with this. So the, the overall concept is the state of machine intelligence in capital markets. Uh, and we're particularly going to look at how machine learning um, is working and whether it's the new alpha generator. That's one of the points. But there will be more. Uh, I won't take any more of their thunder. Uh, and uh, I'll just pass it on to our moderator. Uh, he is uh, an executive director uh, at Morgan Stanley. Uh, and he's working in the FinTech group. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Roland Fejar. Thank you. So um, yeah, let me quickly introduce the topic um, before we come to the panel. <clears throat> machine intelligence in capital markets over the last three, two to three years has, lot, has gotten a lot of attention. Consequently, a lot of promises have been made. Some are ambitious, some are speculative, uh, some are plainly wrong. So we are still at the very early stages of applying this technology in the capital markets context. Um, and other other sectors have been more advanced, and just applying kind of the learnings and techniques of other sectors into the capital market context doesn't just work. So with this panel, we try to explore the current state of machine intelligence in capital markets to take temperature of recent developments, key challenges, and the direction of travel in applying this technology um, in this context in, in order to generate differentiated alpha in, in capital markets. So with that, I feel extremely honored to have such a distinguished panel to, uh, to lead the discussion. And I, I give it to the, to the panelists to introduce themselves. So maybe, Andre, do you want to uh, start? Sure. My name is Andre Rusakov. I'm a co-founder of Data Capital Management, which is a systematic hedge fund in New York City. We specialize on machine learning and novel uh, data to generate forecasts of uh, short to medium term uh, movements and securities traded in the United States. I'm Morgan Slade. I'm CEO of CloudQuant AI. We're an um, investment manager um, with offices in New York, Chicago, and Austin. We also leverage crowd researchers to develop um, investment strategies, complete strategies that we license from them and operate for them for 10% um, of the profits as a royalty. We also um, license signals and, um, and feature engineering royalties uh, that we pay for crowd researchers to develop parts of strategies that we incorporate into our own. Um, we have a, a website that people can do back testing on for free um, at cloudquant.com. Uh, my name is Mark Salmon. I'm a professor of finance and financial econometrics. I currently teach asset management at Cambridge. I'm also a visiting professor in the computing science department at Imperial, where I supervise PhD students in machine learning and finance. Uh, I've worked in the industry, finance industry, for about 30 years, and I spent five years as a senior scientist uh, with a hedge fund in London, and I currently advise Old Mutual. Thank you. So, Mark, maybe starting with you, from an academic perspective, where do we stand? What do you think are the key challenges in applying machine intelligence to capital market problems? Well, actually, that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So, uh, you know, I'll try and... Uh, I, think, I think machine learning is evolving quite, quite rapidly. And um, I don't think we'll be using the same sort of techniques in the same way in three or five years. Uh, if you look at how machine learning has been applied in biomedical sciences, I think the applications in finance, uh, first of all, there's a different nature of the animal in finance, but I think uh, we're probably about five years behind what the uh, equivalent applications are doing in um, uh, biomedical research. The second part of your question, I think, is, is more difficult, and that, I think, has been always a problem for quantitative methods in the finance industry, and as techniques evolve. Um, Personally, I found it very difficult uh, to convince uh, relatively conservative fund managers to take on machine learning techniques. And it's uh, always a permanent surprise to me that they don't listen to what I say, actually. Uh, because I think the techniques are actually uh, very powerful and they have to be used with great care, as I'm going to explain this afternoon. But I think there's a very, very clear conservatism 
which I think is justified within uh, the fund management industry and other aspects of finance. Um, because you need a track record, and I don't think machine learning has got that yet, and you need to have interpretability, particularly from a sales side. So the managers are wary of adopting techniques which they can't themselves explain to the people they're trying to sell their strategies to. And I think we need to establish credibility. And I think the last paper was actually very interesting in the sense that it is really showing a value added over traditional methodologies uh, for adding to a strategy that's been well known for many, many years. Okay. So, Andre, then, I mean, when you explain to investors what you do, how do you kind of bridge that gap of, of trust? So, what we do, we demystify the phenomenon of black box. Uh, it is very important to explain to investors what exactly we do, and to Mark's point, interpretability is very important. Uh, we view machine learning as a generalized regression problem, uh, whereby, uh, yes, it does value, but even the most sophisticated machine learning techniques, in my mind at least, could be explained uh, by more traditional factors, such as value, growth, uh, trend, etc. Now, machine learning does add value on top, it's like a cherry on top, uh, whereby one can use it to enhance uh, portfolio allocation decisions and timing the entry and the exits of your trades better. However, interpretability uh, is something that we uh, show to our investors. I personally have a philosophy of machine plus human or human plus machine. I think uh, that a human armed with a machine intelligently will always outperform machines alone or humans alone. And if I were to draw a parallel, Computers have been playing chess much better than humans for the last what, 20 years or so. However, a very good chess player, not a grandmaster, uh, armed with a great machine, chess playing machine, will outperform the best chess playing machine up until today. And this is certainly the case in finance for now. I think it is likely to stay. And I guess last point on uh, interpretability and how we explain uh, the gap between what investors understand and what is actually doable is Everything, almost every alpha that you find is, in essence, beta to a factor your investor doesn't ask you about. Uh, and once you are comfortable with that, uh, interpretability issue becomes much easier, and uh, this is really what we're doing. Okay. Morgan, from your perspective, what is required to bridge the gap? You know, the established players have, um, have a process they follow. I worked for Milburn Richfield. 20 year, years ago, which is a, a large CTA that had been around for 30 years at that point in time. They were entirely systematic. They had a way of doing things. Their investors expected them to continue to do that. Um, if they had started to talk about using, um, back then it was, you know, regression trees or classification trees, um, they probably would have scared a lot of people. Um, there's a big concern about upsetting the apple cart. If you have something that's working, you're an established player, you have a uh, large AUM, why do you want to introduce some new variable to the equation? Well, I'll tell you why. Um, I think that uh, you bridge the gap by uh, explaining to people that instead of trial and error processes or trying to build um, more and more complex regression models, as Andre kind of alludes to, um, that idea, that kind of concept, um, you know, machine learning gives you um, a boost in efficiency on the research side that you didn't have before. We can do things, you know, 100 times faster than we could before. Um, but there is a problem. Um, it's very easy to go to the dark side. It's very easy to curve fit. And so you have to have immense amount of discipline and essentially recipes within your organization that are established to ensure that people stay on the track and don't go off the rails by curve fitting. And so I think convincing people that you have those safeguards in place is a key part of, of adopting this. So, okay. So, as this is a still a very young kind of field, there's still a lot of academic discovery to be made. At the same time, it's a very practical application um, using, using these technologies in, in, capital, in a capital markets context. So Mark, do you have any best, best practices how collaboration between academia and the practitioner works successfully? Uh, I think it's probably different in the US than it is in the UK. Um, I think the degree of conservatism, as I was talking about, is probably different between the, t you know, the two sides of the Atlantic. Um, the, there are very few academics 
even in finance departments or economics departments, that have a really good, uh, really good knowledge or feel for what markets are about. And I think that's one of the major problems. I mean, <laughs> academics are too academic, okay? Uh, so I think uh, getting, uh, getting them to become uh, more attuned to uh, the real world, I think, is actually a very important issue for academia as a whole. Um, there are very few people in... I mean, the problem is also that machine learning is, is, is not really in the domain at the moment of finance faculties. It's starting but uh, it's in computing science departments and stats departments. And again, it's even, you know, the people in those departments don't know any finance either. So I think there's a real difficulty in trying to bridge the gap because it's just a bit too young. Um, okay, so Morgan, do you have specific examples how you collaborate with academia to kind of enhance your knowledge base? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think, um, I agree with Mark, I think that uh, there are certain topics um, within quantitative trading that uh, academics maybe have, have some edge. Um, I think uh, in particular, they, um, they provide a lot of insights into um, you know, portfolio construction um, and even transaction cost modeling, um, or at least a framework to approach it with. Um, we um, work directly with uh, several of the Chicago schools, um, including University of Chicago, where we actually bring in um, uh, Masters of Financial Mathematics students. Um, we bring in about a half a dozen every semester, and they work on actual projects for us. In addition to the fact that we're a crowd researching organization, where we essentially are, you know, inviting people to come contribute their investment ideas for um, for profit, um, trying to engage them as essentially an extended part of our workforce um, and contributors to you know the alpha process. Um, you know, we plan on doing a, um, a tour with one of the alternative data vendors um, uh, with, you know, the top U.S. institutions um, and going around and holding tournaments on CloudQuant AI for the students who are studying data science to do data science on CloudQuant AI to try it out and see if they want to be a hedge fund analyst, you know, at a distance. So um, we're actively engaging um, the U.S. Uh, colleges and, and we're also expanding into India and China. and. Um, uh, but obviously, we, um, we interact with them kind of virtually through um, CloudQuant AI, through our um, you know, Jupyter Hub platform. So. Andre, how do you think the knowledge exchange can be better facilitated between academia and the practitioners? Uh, so in my mind, the, the key gap there is be academia on one hand, uh, they usually have a lack of clean, uh, very robust data sets to experiment with. They also have a little bit of a lack of understanding uh, of practical problems that practitioners face in terms of execution, uh, transaction cost modeling, uh, market impact, what it actually means, uh, fill, fill, uh, order fill rates, etc. On the other hand, uh, practitioners feel not invested enough or not invested at all in the lightest cutting edge uh, machine learning technologies because these technologies are usually not proven yet. Uh, why take a risk? Why uh, really dive deep into something you don't know will pan out and something you don't fully understand uh, the logic and the mechanics and the mathematics behind? So both of them clearly can support each other's weaknesses if they work together. However, what I think gets broken down is uh, there is usually no clear uh, timelines and deliverables agreed upon, and therefore the tangible process uh, between uh, what is being done between academia and the practitioners is harder to assess, uh, but this is something that could be fixed and I think should be fixed. To your point, I think you're doing a great job integrating this into your world, yeah. uh, and we are uh, not as advanced, I think, as uh, we should have been uh, in terms of integrating with uh, guys like you yeah, and you your PhD students. As well. well, it's 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 available to anybody with an internet connection, right? Fine. So. Okay. So coming a little bit to the challenges, I mean, Morgan, in your daily work, what are the key challenges you, uh, you encounter <laughs> applying machine, machine intelligence in, in capital markets? Uh, sure. So um, we've been running a quantitative fund for seven years. Uh, we've got a share of north of three using um, our own capital. Um, and we're establishing, you know, institutional investing opportunities this year for outside investors. Our biggest challenges are um, finding um, high quality people. So our model is designed to try before we buy people and bring them in house. Um, 
And then some people don't really want to work for a fund. They don't want to work in a, in a money center. So what you'll do is you'll find them, um, you'll find them contributing alpha signals and other things um, in other ways to the process. Um, but you know, I, I think um, you know, for us, um, being able to try before we buy um, is a really critical part of our business model. And um, we view that there's a massive you know, kind of human capital <laughs> gap um, in the hedge fund industry. Um, I think it was Eagle Alpha CEO said that there are 1,500 data sets um, at uh, the Newsweek uh, conference, um, you know, I think it was a few months ago, and he forecasted there was going to be 5,000 in, in, in three years, and he indicated that based on their estimates, only about 50 of them were really actively being looked at. Um, that's exactly why CloudQuant AI is here. I mean, we, we have a whole army of data scientists that are um, actively, you know, coming to our platform to do research and we can give them um, free access to these data sets that normally only people like Mark would get access to for free um, as an academic. Um, but we can give them access to try and you know, scout out these virgin um, sources of alpha and potentially stamp their name on it and get a royalty for, for doing that. That's exciting for anybody who you know, can't get an interview at one of the big firms. And that's probably most of us, right? So um, I think um, we're kind of in a new age where we're leveling the playing field. It doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, we have people from 140 countries um, active on our platform. Thank you. So, Andre, as, as you kind of gather more assets uh, on the management and you scale your, your fund, what, what challenges do you encounter in that kind of scaling up of your um, AI-driven hedge fund? So the biggest problem in applying AI or machine learning to finance, in my personal opinion, is non-stationarity of data sets. What I mean by that is, one cannot assume that the uh, structure in the data set that you have found applying different machine learning techniques will stay the same uh, in future. Uh, for example, when, and most of the machine learning techniques, especially the ones that are available off the shelf uh, through open source libraries, have been developed to facilitate uh, advertising technology. But these are very different problems. Finance is different in the sense that, let's say, Amazon is uh, forecasting uh, my likelihood to buy something on Amazon, or they discovered a relationship in a data set where a middle-aged American woman is very likely, living in Manhattan of certain income bracket, is very likely to click on diapers and uh, anti-aging products. That relationship is very stable. It's unlikely to change two years from now, a year from now, five years from now. If they see the, this combination of features, it is likely to mean that she's likely to click on this and this. Where in finance, everything is dependent on everything, uh, and it creates a complexity where things just change all the time. Uh, and the only, in my mind, two ways to solve this is either you have a very uh, long history in your data set, which has seen it all, uh, and that's hard to achieve, or uh, you constantly discover new data sets, to your point, where we're going from 1,500 to 5,000 allegedly. You bring them in, uh, you apply machine learning techniques, you find structure, you pr productionize them quicker than others, and that's how you stay ahead of the game. Because the other part of this is alpha decay is real. You discover a signal, uh, you start trading on it, other people pick it up, all of a sudden, sudden the signal disappears and the structure in your data set disappears. Uh, where in advertising technology is not the case. Uh, people's uh, buying behaviors don't really change, or they change not as fast as things change in finance. But don't you think ad tech can be used in high-frequency trading, though? Oh, absolutely. If you're talking about high-frequency trading, uh, that's a very different problem to solve. Uh, what I'm more, mostly referring is to forecasting, call it five, to, um, five days to a month uh, returns of security prices. There, therefore, you can't really assume that your variables are independently distributed uh, because everything is dependent. And the second problem, actually, to that point is, I, contrary to a common belief, there is not enough data and there is not enough observations. What I mean by that is, I cannot get a Federal Reserve to jack up uh, the interest rate and then lower them down and then go them up and lower them down just for the sake of my experimentation. Unless you're doing high-frequency trading, uh, this, the data set becomes very scarce because the exact combination of the parameters is only seen once. So you can either uh, cluster the time periods and say, okay, these times look similar to these times and these times look similar to these times, and that's how you 
uh, enrich your observation set. But that's a big problem. It's, it's not easy to do, and it's not as straightforward. Whereby, oh, sir. I mean, I think this is, this is one of the issues that, I, that I'm going to talk about again this afternoon. And this is the distinction between correlation and causation. And what's one of the frontiers of what's happening in uh, machine learning is introducing causal analysis into machine learning, which has typically just been predictive. So the ability to sort of go through counterfactual uh, experiments by using the appropriate statistical techniques like instrumental variables or there's a range of things that uh, gives us an ability to bring into machine learning not just simply prediction but causal analysis which enables us to do, uh, if you like, policy regime analysis and also makes our predictions more robust across regimes. And that's a, that's a critical issue. That's what causality is about. A causal prediction is going to be uh, stable across interventions. And that's why we need to have causal predictions in machine learning. I agree with that. That's a holy grail of uh, predictions. Yeah, but that's, what's yep. that's what I think what's, is starting to happen uh, in the theory, in the th theoretical applications at least. It isn't in the industry yet, but as I'll talk about a little bit this afternoon, that's what's happening. So actually, yeah, we're already coming kind of to the next topic, which I wanted to kind of ask you, Mark, about is kind of hearing all those challenges that Morgan and Ray face is kind of what's, what's the cutting edge of, of research in, <laughs> in kind of applying machine intelligence? Now, now that actually is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. <laughs> but maybe you want so, to give a little bit okay. of, a, of, a, of a teaser so, so people... Uh... Well, I think, I think the main thing is uh, there have been tremendous developments in terms of bringing statistical inference back into machine learning. Uh, the classical division between the two cultures by Bremen many years ago between uh, data models and theory models is breaking down as we have new tools, as I'll explain this afternoon, to enable us to ex post uh, analyze the true statistical inference um, of, of the model that we've developed through machine learning. Um, and I think, again, it's the separation of prediction from causation. So to move the focus from prediction to uh, causal analysis, causal prediction uh, in machine learning. Uh, there's been a huge developments recently which uh, will come through. This is what I'm saying. Machine learning is not this fixed box of tools. It's evolving all the time. And in a few years' time, we'll be doing things that, you know, we don't know uh, probably exist yet. But, um, but regimes, I, th I mean, regimes, I think, are a really important issue, which machine learning can actually handle you know, relatively easily. We have, um, you know, theory tells us that a, an efficient price has a, a risk premium embedded in it. So if there's predictability in the risk premium, there'll be predictability in the price, in the efficient price. And that's the return for holding the risk. So predictability is not inconsistent with market efficiency if it's the predictability that's contained in the risk premium. And we know that the risk premium varies as the stochastic discount factor co-varies with uh, macro variables like consumption. And so that variation over time gives rise to time-bearing predictability. All of us know that our strategies don't work all of the time. And so we have regimes of strategies working at different times. And this is where ASCO was using a, a, a forecast combination method. We can see how machine learning can build us through the lasso, which is an ideal, if you like, uh, forecast combination type uh, algorithm, an adaptive forecast combination mechanism. <clears throat> so an adaptive system, which has got continuously changing at every period, you reinvestigate your universe of strategies and recombine them, is, a, is an obvious way in which you're going to be able to respond to the changing risk premia that are in the markets. So I think that is, you know, it's a very clear uh, route for not sort of static machine learning, but an adaptive response to the risk premium changing in the markets. So not, not to challenge you, Mark, but you know, so you're talking about using exogenous factors to describe regime changes. Do you think that there's... No, um, no, I don't know. There's, there's nothing changing. Uh, it's good, good that we have a fight a little bit, but uh, yeah. this, I'm not saying exogenous <laughs> factors. But basically, I think, you know, this is just the data telling us when there is a regime change by selecting different strategies out of a subset of strategies which you're throwing at it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like something like a Markov, you know, the dumb sort of Markov chain type stuff where you have to predict when the regime is going to take place by specifying a, a mechanism. This is a machine learning identification of regimes 
and we don't have to pre-specify anything except the tools so that we're going to use. Is it the data that's telling you the regime yeah. or the strategy? The, the, the data is going to select the, from the subset of strategies those that are working at a particular point in time. I mean, this is, this is something that I've been doing with uh, Ingrid Cross there, as, who's a PhD student at uh, Imperial. So we have this adaptive uh, uh, system in place yeah. using Elastic Net for trying to find, distinguish between strategies at each particular time point. So, so Morgan, hearing kind of what, what Mark is kind of focused at in his research and, and where kind of from his perspective, um, the, the kind of development of machine intelligence and capital markets going, how relevant is that uh, for you kind of managing money and how do you kind of encounter these kind of uh, aspects? Well, I mean, we, we have similar problems. So one of the ones I personally work on has to do with risk allocation and portfolio construction of a portfolio of systematic strategies. Uh, it definitely involves regime switching um, behaviors. Um, there, there are potentially some opportunities for using deep learning uh, with the data set sizes that we have. Um, but, um, and I, you know, we haven't really talked too much about that, about, you know, where can you use different techniques? Um, I think it's worth mentioning that I think, um, you know, when I was at Citadel doing high frequency market making, um, you know, about 10 years ago, um, you know, we used, um, we used machine learning um, and um, we used a lot of the techniques that are, are kind of more commonplace now. Um, we um, were able to do that because it worked and we had enough data and the things we were trying to model were fairly um, supply and demand driven. So, uh, so they were somewhat stable and didn't really change every day. Um, now, you can also, you know, apply deep learning to, um, uh, to transaction cost modeling. Um, and I think that uh, there are some applications in the longer time horizons when you have lots of data that you could potentially use it cross-sectionally. Um, for us, we're building a set of tools um, that have a workflow kind of embedded within them um, where you can, you know, as a data scientist, kind of plug in and use extreme gradient boosting or use random forest to identify some alpha signals. It, we, you know, kind of pose a very simple question that's tractable, and um, our job is to give them tool sets that, um, that are close enough to, um, to give them guardrails so that they know kind of what they're, what they're supposed to do, but they can still do the feature engineering and, um, and, and explore the data sets that are so important to us. Um, for, for me, I think that um, I still would describe what Mark's saying as, you know, an exogenous approach because he's looking at unrelated factors potentially to try and figure out which models to trade. And um, we, you know, I tend to look at things more endogenously where I actually look at inside the, the large number of strategies we have to try and understand their interrelationship with each other and what they're telling me about each other. So maybe a difference in how we view things. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. I mean, it can be both. I mean, this is... This I think letting, letting the data speak for itself is one area where I think uh, you know, we can learn from machine learning a lot instead of building theoretical models which yeah. don't necessarily work. And, and really, frankly, my approach has more to do with what discretionary traders do. Yeah. Um, when they have something that's working, they do more of it. When they have something that's not, they do less of it. Yeah. So, Andre, data is part of your company's name. So, what's it your... It is indeed, yes. <laughs> For me? It is indeed, <laughs> yes. Um, so how do you think about kind of the relationship between data and machine learning? What's, what's your perspective on that? Well, they go hand in hand together. Uh, the, uh, and uh, they complement and make it more complex at the same time. Uh, the thesis is very simple. The more data you have about a security or a set of securities, the more likely uh, your investment decision is going to be better. Uh, the less data you have, the harder it is to view it from multiple angles. However, the more data you have, it is more complicated to make sure that your data set is clean, uh, that you can actually use it, and you don't overfit the model. Uh, because if you have way too much of it, it's very easy to your early point to overfit and just uh, start predicting noise. What, what do you do if you have too many non-informative samples? Well, first, what we do, we uh, try to do factor reduction. So we basically go from thousands of different uh, features to call it a dozen or two that matter. And because uh, we're fundamental delivers that we have to understand these uh, features, uh, we apply a sanity check to it. So for example, if we're trying to build a model that is predicting returns of um, financial sector stocks, and all of a sudden the model, the model is not picking up on 
uh, interest rates or um, FX. I would question if that feature selection model, machine learning model that we applied, actually is worth it. I mean, isn't the problem with um, feature selection? Most of the techniques that are used, it's kind of a democracy. The more data you have, potentially uninformative data, it gets more votes than the informative data you I actually agree about. with that, and that's why uh, data point is, it is extremely You're important. You agree with me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're in the same field somewhat, but you, you, you tend to have uh, higher frequency trading than us. Uh, at least my understanding is that. So my view is that it is very important to have my, uh, economic understanding of what actually matters, uh, to your point that you don't just take garbage and model garbage. Uh, and you have to pre-select features that go into your training set. Uh, if you don't, uh, then you're likely uh, just fire, finding spurious correlations. So in my mind, it is much easier for a quantitative researcher to adapt and learn how to uh, adapt and change a little bit their data set than to a uh, machine learning expert who has never dealt with markets uh, to build a model that actually works. Yeah, I, th I think you're pointing to one of the gaps we have, like what, what is cutting edge right now? I think feature selection, the standard procedures for doing that are, are pretty bad. I, I think they do a pretty board, poor job of, of selecting the actual yes. features that matter yeah. because they kind of take this democratic, you know, minimum, you know, uh, minimizing entropy approach to, um, to selecting features and trying to attribute importance based on that. When, you know, you're really trading as a business of outliers. We make money by having huge gains, not by you know trading the average, mm -hmm. and um, and so I think that's one of the problems that systematic quants have is we have a proprietary trading business that's in a, another um, subsidiary, and so we have insight into proprietary traders as well as having been one myself, and you know they place a lot of bets, but you know far fewer than the quants do, and they tend to be much bigger and much more well informed. Whereas quants kind of trade averages and you know, they don't place as big a bets on the outliers where they do have some additional information because the frameworks we choose tend to be focused on building baskets of things that are well diversified. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think really people need to be looking at alternative data differently and saying, you know what, um, we have more context here. We need to figure out more quantitative ways to place more concentrated bets uh, like the discretionary traders do. Great, so with that I would like to Thank the panel for the first part, and uh, we have another 20 or so minutes uh, for Q&A, so I'd like to open it up to the, to the floor and, and, and get questions. Andre answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just say something about data? Pardon me? Can I just say something about data? Sure, yeah. Okay, because you, you said you're going to ask me about data, so <laughs> you can ask me about data. I think, I think statisticians are worried a bit about big data. It, it poses a number of theoretical questions for them. We've been based on sampling theory for many, many years, and now we're having to deal with sort of sample sizes which are close to the population size, and this raises a number of theoretical questions for statisticians. And I, and I think, and I'm talking about this now because I won't have time to talk about it this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So the, the statisticians are interested in the, in, in the quality of data as opposed to the quantity of data. And you know, there's, there's a large amount of data which is completely irrelevant for any particular problem. And so the question is how do you sift through this data and give it some sort of quality rating? So we've spent the last sort of 150 years trying to develop uh, sampling theory uh, and all of a sudden now we're being thrown data sets which have got no rigorous basis in terms of how the data is really being collected. So uh, for instance if you have a survey which uh, or a data set which covers 80% of the population but is not a random survey okay or you've got a, another survey which has got 20% coverage of the population but is a random survey which do you give more credibility to? So the 80% coverage, but non-random, could be completely concentrated on a small, you know, a subset of individuals that don't represent, say, the big spenders, if they're in the 20%. Yep. So we're being thrown data which hasn't been, if you like, gone through the verification process of the national statistical offices if, uh, and survey design. So this is, this is a question, there may be a lot of data out there, there may be a lot of bad, bad data out there, there may be a lot of irrelevant data out there, and it's a question of quality, not quantity. Uh, and I think what the statisticians are thinking about are how we get 
data quality indices which we can use to put into uh, our models to judge whether the data is relevant for a particular objective. Most of the data that big data is throwing up hasn't been selected but for an inference objective. But isn't final. the proof in the pudding? I mean, it's not going to make money in the back test if you... Well, you've got to be very careful of how your data is selected because if your data is just concentrating on a subset of the population that you're looking at, then you can't generalize out of that subset of the population. And that's precisely the sort of point about you know, having randomized sampling. <laughs> You sample across the population in a random way, so you've got the generality of conclusion. So I think you know, there are these issues which are quite important in terms of how data is, what is the nature of the data that we're getting from a number of big data sources? I'm much more concerned about you know, data sets that have different sampling frequencies, figuring out ways to put them into the same machine learning models. Um, I'm more concerned about those sampling problems as opposed to the ones you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean they both, both exist. Yeah. Maybe quickly, Andre, what's your concern in terms of on, 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 that, on that topic? My, my concern is that usually the depth of the data is uh, not deep enough, and the length of the period that uh, the data set is produced, is available, is not long enough. Because we're producing slightly longer duration uh, security price movements, we need longer uh, time series, and they're usually not available. And to your point, People do often, the data vendors, I mean, they do often change the approach to how they sample data. Yeah. And that's a huge problem because then you can't really train your algorithms on that until you have a consistent sampling uh, through the whole time series. But most importantly, to your point, there is a lot of garbage data out there and it's hard to distinguish which one is which from the outset. And one spends a lot of time figuring out whether it's usable or not. Uh, the data sets that I usually tend to be uh, useful and I think will be useful in future are the ones that are giving you a granular data on either consumer behavior or, my, or economic behavior of people or entities or uh, trading behavior of people, uh, fund flows, etc. So these things will be very valuable in my mind to uh, building models that are applicable to capital markets. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, maybe in the meantime, there was a question up front here. Yeah. Maybe if you ask the question, can you quickly introduce yourself as well? So. Hi, I just wanted to come back to one of the points uh, Andre uh, uh, raised about the fact that we actually don't have nearly enough data. And when you, when you go and try and test something specific, you don't find enough of those observations. Uh, you gave some, some ideas about clustering or, uh, or, or finding mm, something similar. What else could we add to that when, when we have a, a sparse set of big data? So I think the problem is twofold. One is the time dimension, and the other one is uh, the securities dimension. So in an ideal world, you want to test your model in you know, times like this uh, on securities like this. So for example, if right now you're looking to trade Tesla, um, what would have been the Tesla? And you assume that these are the certain macroeconomic environments, uh, and this is where the market is uh, trending, and these are the PE ratios, et cetera, and you define your macro regime uh, in a certain way, then you find another macro regime, let's say it's 2001, which is similar to this one, and you say, okay, what was the Tesla, Teslas of uh, 2001? And maybe it's Cisco, I don't know. Uh, so you have to concatenate those uh, times and those companies like these in, in this example, and that's how you create a synthetic uh, regime, and that's how you probably should approach the problem. But it's not an easy thing to solve. And Mark, does the regime approach uh, uh, complicates that, as in you, you make your data even more segmented? I d uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear. I was speaking about the sparsity of data when you try and test, uh, back test something specifically, and you, you spoke earlier um, about the fact that you can try and set regimes straight from the data. Does that make uh, the sparsity of data, the, the, the lack of data on a specific hypothesis, even a bigger problem, an even bigger problem? Uh, well, I think this is where you know, statistical inference comes in. Uh, in a sense, we can see if there isn't evidence in the data properly through statistical inference. So as we're doing uh, an analysis of regimes, if the evidence isn't statistically relevant or significant, 
then, then that means the data is weak. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems with traditional methods of analysis, if you like, statistical analysis, you have a model and you then get the data to estimate the model. Um, you, you then reject the model, but you never actually think about whether the data itself is not sufficiently strong to actually support the model that you've got. Well, some people do, but that, that actually is the other alternative when a model is rejected, that you just simply don't have the evidence in the data. And I think this is all to do with conditioning. Um, so, you know, if, if what, you, what you really want to do with machine learning, if we're focusing simply on prediction or classification, which I regard as a prediction system, is really you want to have uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, in your data set of the type of uh, behavior that's going to occur in, your, in the period where you're going to apply your model, if you like, out of sample. And the question is really, do you have any evidence inside your sample which is going to represent the application period of your sample? And that's true of all statistical analysis, but it's particularly true, I think, of, um, of machine learning. Um, because its emphasis is on prediction uh, without any sort of causal, causal analysis. And we all, we're all aware uh, of you know, the problems with spurious correlation. So taking, you know, uh, data sets which just arise, uh, we may well, I mean, there was, there, I, I got some examples this afternoon, but there's the classic case in the 1970s when inflation was related to uh, rainfall in the UK. Uh, and so what the Monetary Policy Committee should have been doing to control inflation was actually do something about the rain instead. I mean, we've got thousands of examples of spurious correlation of weak data, effectively. And this is why having a confidence in the data that you're using is very, very important. And the, str the strength of the data is critically important. And that's what statistical inference gives us. So maybe we have time for one or two other questions. Um, yes, the lady. Maybe wait for, for the microphone. So one of the challenges that I've noticed is that there seems to be somewhat of a disconnect in approach between statisticians and computer sciences in that computer scientists are developing machine learning techniques and looking for things that work. And they're trying to validate yes or no, is this a good model or not? Whereas statisticians are often looking at probabilistic margins and error margins. And you know, as a finance person, when I try to stitch those things together, if I've got a model that doesn't come with error margins, and then I have to put it into either a Bayesian framework or a model combination or something that does, then I end up having to either make a lot of unrealistic assumptions or stitch things together or use a lot of computing power simulating the error margins. Um, how do you guys approach that? Do you, do you usually just throw things out if you're not sure or do you have ways of squaring that circle? Well, I mean, there, there are, again, one of the things I'm going to talk about this afternoon is new methods of inference which are based upon post-model selection. So as you go through your model and have a, have a model which has been constructed through the data, as opposed to an ex-ante which you've drawn from some theory, uh, there are now modern methods of inference which enable you to do ex-post inference on data-derived models. Okay, uh, so post-model selective inference is one of the big advances in machine learning. Uh, I think the other problem if you're talking about, if you like, traditional um, computer science generated machine learning is that the nature of the data is very different. So in finance, we typically have non-IID data, whereas in other, many applications like, you know, picture recognition or whatever else, it, it tends to be IID data. And so there are, as I said earlier, I think there are different animals in these different situations. So we have different techniques. We have to develop different techniques which are appropriate for the application of machine learning in finance. Um, Mark, the same as medical, biomedical research. I, th I, think, I think one of the things that you're kind of touching on is there's actually no real underlying theory that predicts the ideal recipe for doing machine learning. 
because it's it's really an engineering problem. Um, and kind of what what the uh, the person asking the question is is pointing to is how do you how do you bridge that disconnect between engineers in the field building systematic trading strategies who have to make money, and the fact that we don't really have a theory as to what type of random forest or extreme gradient boosting model you should be using for this particular data set. There's no theory for that. It's not science. It's something you have to learn by trial and error. It's a recipe you have to come up with. Um, and I think that's hard for people to understand is we have an engineering discipline and we have you know, a science in math. Um, and they don't always work and play well together. So with that, uh, we unfortunately have to close the panel, but all the panelists are, I think, here for the lunch break, so feel free to kind of continue the discussion um, during lunch. Thanks a lot for everybody's attention. Thank you. Thanks. This is Raven Pack.